Book of Acts, chapter 20. We're getting close to finishing the book of Acts. We're going to be here for a little bit longer. Uh, just for you, so you know, once we finish the book of Acts, we're going to run right into the book of Romans. So I'm excited about the book of Romans. But currently, we are in the book of Acts. Always reminding you guys, uh, hopefully you're not tired of hearing it. This is the beginning of the church. The book of Acts is is a book that describes to us the beginning of the church. We are extremely blessed in that we, I believe, are the church that is the finishing of the church. Uh, it was difficult in the beginning of the church and the opposition, and it seemed to be getting difficult in the closing of the church uh, before uh, the great tribulation comes and the return of our Lord. So we'll see some similarities, I believe, as we go through here. Paul, in the chapter 20, is on his third missionary trip. Uh, he is currently in Ephesus. Uh, he spent three years in Ephesus teaching them and, and strengthening the church there in Ephesus. Um, there was just this huge uproar in Ephesus. The uproar was caused by Demetrius, who is a sim, uh, silversmith, um, and he was angry because the people there at Ephesus were accepting the Lord, and therefore they were changing their way of life. He referred to them, their, their Christianity as the way because they, they were no longer living the way they used to. They were now living a life different in Christ. And because they now knew and understood that man-made idols were not gods. They now learned that and knew that and accepted that. Therefore, they stopped buying idols that Demetrius was selling, making and selling. So anytime our pocketbook is affected, it angers us. Uh, he was angry. Other idol makers were angry. Other people who were not participating in, in um, certain markets and things were angry because the people's way of life had changed. They were no longer purchasing idols. They were no longer living uh, the life that they were. They were now different. They lived their lives in a whole different way. So there was an uprising, big uproar. Uh, the only way it was stopped, a few people tried to stop it. Paul was kept from going in. Uh, a Jewish leader went in there trying to let him know, yeah, we don't like Paul either. They shut him down. So they finally had a, a city official who went in there uh, and, and told the crowd, listen, if you have an issue with this Paul guy and what the, these people are doing, take him to court. Okay, this isn't how you solve it by having a riot out here and, and an uprising out here. If you have an issue and it's a legitimate issue, take them to court, handle it in the courts. He says, and if you don't end this thing, then the Roman guards are going to come in here and they're going to end it. And they're not going to be nice about it. They're going to be harsh and strong armed with their authority. So you guys need to all go home. And they did. They just said, all right, nobody wanted to get, you know, in trouble with the Romans. Uh, they didn't want to uh, have the thing addressed the way that it would have been addressed if the rioting had continued. So they all decided to disperse and to go back to their home, which is where our text today picks up. Uh, Acts chapter 20, beginning in verse 1. It says, after the uproar has ceased... Paul called the disciples to himself, embraced them, and departed to go to Macedonia. And when he had gone over that region and encouraged them with many words, he came to Greece. And he stayed three months. And when the Jews plotted against him as he was about to sail to Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. And so Padar uh, of Berea accompanied him to Asia, also uh, Aristarchus uh, and Sedecus of the Thessalonians and Gaius of Derby and Timothy and Tychicus and, and Trophimus of Asia. These men going ahead waited for us at Troas. But we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread and in five days joined them in Troas where we stayed seven days. Father, we are blessed to have your word. And so as we open it to, together, Lord, give us insight, Father. 
Give us your understanding, Father, Lord, that we may see these things that you've had written down for us, that with them we can understand you and your ways. We can see your grace, your power, your work. And Lord, that we would see your love and your mercy towards us, Father. So bless your word as we open it together. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. So after three years, Paul has now left Ephesus. Perhaps he figured the uproar was a time or a signal or a sign from the Lord. You know what? It's time to move on. But whatever, however the Lord led Paul, he knew and understood that the Lord wanted him to move on from there. Uh, so he goes to the region of Macedonia and he comes to Greece. Now, if we look at the map here, uh, he, he, he's going through the, the region of Macedonia, like my little stick here. Uh, and and, and he, he's, going, he's coming through here and traveling up into this area, the region of Macedonia. Ends up down here in Greece, uh, which, which is probably he ended up in Corinth, is what most believe is where he ended up. Uh, but, but he goes through this region and comes to Greece and... and we're not told exactly where he went, but through this region of, of Macedonia, those are churches that he's previously planted. So, so he's going to these churches where he's previously uh, been used by God to plant, but he goes through them uh, and it says that he encouraged them with many words. Paul's an encourager. He has a heart for those that accept the Lord. He's not simply trying to score um, a big movement. He's not trying to put notches in his belt, if you will. I've started this many churches or I've led this many to the Lord. He has a passion and a concern for those that have accepted Christ that they continue in Christ. And so therefore he's going back through the area where the churches he has already planted or been used by God to plant and he's encouraging them. With, with, and it says with many words, Many words. It wasn't just like, come on, you guys. He, he was there. He was encouraging. He was sharing. He was listening. He's an encourager. And as busy as he was, he loved preaching the gospel. He loved going on mission trips. Uh, their travel was all done by foot, but he took the time. He had places he wanted to go and be in certain times. So he, he had to fit all this together and and yet he took the time. It's not like, I don't have time to see you. I don't have time to do that. He went through and he was an encourager. Encouraging one another is such, such an important part of our Christian walk. It's so important, you guys. And we're all, we all should be encouragers. Our Christian walk is a constant war and a constant battle against temptation. All of us if we're honest with ourselves, know that every day the enemy comes after us and suggests something and tempts us with something. He's never going to leave us alone. And so there's this constant battle of being a Christian. There's this constant temptation. All of us face temptation. All of us face fears. All of us face discouragement. And the idea behind the enemy is to get us to that point to where we just throw up our arms and say, I, you know, I'm tired. I just don't, I just don't want to do this anymore. And just to surrender to whatever it is that he's coming at us with. But all of us face this, you guys. Jesus tells us in John 16, he says, in the world, you will have tribulation. And we're in the world. We may not be of the world, but we're in the world. And the opposition is always there. The temptation is always there. Some people like, like to present to the world that I have no temptation. I have no sin. I'm an amazing Christian. Oh, look at you. And they condemn. But truth be told, everybody's tempted. It always fascinates me, the boldness and the arrogance of Satan, that he would go and, and tempt Jesus. The, Jesus, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, the, the part of the Trinity of God. Jesus is God. And Satan says, well, you know, he wasn't in the position of, I mean, like he's really going to stumble, like he's really going to sin. He tempted him straight up. If you're this, then do that. If God made you this promise, then do this. If you're hungry, then do that. And he, if he's that bold with Jesus, 
No one understand. He's that bold against every Christian. When we accept the Lord, he is angry. And his goal to the day of our last breath is to pull us away from God. So Jesus tells us, listen, know this. In this world, you will have tribulation. Paul told the Christians in Acts 14, 22, he says, we must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. To get into the kingdom of God, we are going to go through many tribulations. And I can remember when Jeanette and I first accepted the Lord, they warned us. As a Christian, listen, you're going to really, really be hit hard. And, and, and we were so excited in our new Christian life, and, and everything was glorious to us. I remember even, have you had problems today? Because no, today was a great day. Me too, me too. And, and it was just so exciting and so glorious and so happy. And, and the older Christians would always what, tell us, you know, well, it's coming. And I'd think, well, I don't think so. But it did come, and it comes in all of our lives. And, and, and so there's no exceptions, you guys. There isn't a Christian that walks this earth that doesn't face temptation, that doesn't face fear, that doesn't face discouragements, that doesn't face trials. We must go through many tribulations as we're entering into the kingdom of God. Look how Paul describes a Christian life in 2 Corinthians Chapter 4, beginning in verse 8, he says, We are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, yet not in despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken. We are struck down, but not destroyed. We are punched. We are knocked down. We, are, we struggle, but there's a the victory in Christ. But, but he doesn't. He doesn't say, listen, if you're having problems, you're probably in sin. You know what? If you're having problems, then you're probably not doing this right. You know what? If you're struggling, it's probably because you're too close to the world. He straight up says, as a Christian, we are hard-pressed, perplexed, persecuted, and struck down. Not, for, not because we've done things wrong. Not because we're not doing things right. But because we're Christians. The world and Satan is opposed to us, and therefore they come hard against us. We always think if, if or have this wrong idea that if, if you're struggling, then you're, you're, you must be messing up. But Paul doesn't say that. He doesn't say he goes to Macedonia to encourage them because they're really messing up. They're struggling. They're being tempted. They're being challenged. Being a Christian is not easy. For any of us. And that's why it is so important for, for us all, all of us, to make sure that we make the time to encourage one another. We see each other once a week. And, you know, how are you doing? I'm doing good. And yet sometimes inside we're smiling going, I am so dying inside, but I'm not going to tell anybody. Love the Lord. And we're dying inside. Various reasons. It could be embarrassment. It could be, well, everybody else is happy. I don't want to be the only struggling Christian. But we don't. Okay, so long as I got a good answer out of you, move on to the next person. We have to make the time. Lord, there's people, there's brothers and sisters in the Lord that are facing some difficulties. And we need to encourage them. Remember, our text says that, that Paul encouraged them with many words. He didn't encourage them with miracles. He encouraged them with many words. Proverbs 12, 25 says, Anxiety in the heart of man causes depression, but a good word makes it glad. A word of encouragement encourages our heart and makes our hearts glad. We may not be able to fix or change the situations that people are going through, but a good word is so encouraging. If we would just take the time to, you know, to encourage one another. Sometimes we avoid people because 
we're afraid that they may ask, you know, or tell us their struggles and we don't have answers for them and we can't fix it. We can't change it. But we just need to encourage one another. Isaiah 35, beginning in verse 3, says, Strengthen the weak hands. Make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who are fear, uh, fearful hearted, be strong. Do not fear. Behold, your God will come. He doesn't say strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Do this for them. He says, say to those that are having a hard time, be strong. God's got you. He's with you. And, and, and they, they will be encouraged. Weak hands means sinking. We're, we're beginning to sink, whether it be in water or quicksand or whatever, we're sinking. So Isaiah is encouraging us that we, we are to strengthen those who are sinking. We see it. We see that they're not as on fire as they used to be. They're not as happy as they used to be. They're not as excited as they used to be. They seem to be down. They, I, I watched them, and, and week after week, they seem to be sinking. Then he says, so encourage them. Share with them. They're sinking. And you see them sinking. God's revealed to you they're sinking. Feeble knees means tottering and stumbling. We are to, to, to help give stability to those who are stumbling. Reach out and steady them. It, it doesn't say that we're to rebuke them. It doesn't say that we're to tell them how to get right. It says that we're to encourage them. God's got you through this. I don't feel them. Yeah, you know, sometimes we don't feel the work of God, but it doesn't mean he's not there. He says that he will never leave us nor forsake us. And it's not based on my feelings. It's based on the truth of his word. I don't see him doing anything. It's not based on our sight. It's based on his promise. He'll take you through this. You will, you will get to the other end. You will get to the end of this tumble, tunnel. You will, you will wrap up this situation in the hands of God. I don't see it. Yeah, I, sometimes we don't. What do you think I should do? Just draw close to the Lord. Trust him. That's it? Yeah. Because we can't solve their problems. I don't know what God's teaching them. I don't know what God's doing in and through them. I don't know what God is using their situation for. Perhaps it has nothing to do with them. Perhaps it's for the person over here that's keeping an eye on them and realizes they're in worse shape than me and they're okay. Why are they okay? And ask, how come you're not all throwing a fit like I'm throwing a fit? You're in worse shape. They treated you worse than they treated me. Why are you okay? You know what? I rest on the Lord. Really? Yeah. I don't know what God's doing, but be an encourager. Come alongside. It's so easy or tempting for us to not necessarily be an encourager, but to be judgmental. Well, you know, it's because you're not doing this. Well, you know, if you would start doing more of this, then that would change. Well, you know, and it's easy for us to just give solutions. And, and the majority of the people that we tell it to knows I should be reading more. I, I should be doing this more. I shouldn't be doing that. And, and it's, it's not that we necessarily are called by God to remind them. God just says, listen, they're sinking. They're sinking. Go help them. Well, I told them to read more. I told them to do this. I told them to knock that off. They're sinking. They're not grabbing on to what I said. What do you want? I threw them a line. Not my fault they won't grab it. They're sinking. They're stumbling. They're wobbling. You know, we need to be that encourager with our words. And, and this is where I, I so emphasize, you guys, we need to seek the Lord how to be that encourager. What to say. Sometimes it's just lovingly 
talking about the Lord. Not, you know, well, I think I'm going to bring this up because I know they struggle with that. So I'm going to talk about this so that they go, huh, just be sensitive. They're struggling. They're sinking. They're wobbling. They're having a hard time. So this is why Paul, he didn't go back through Macedonia to rebuke them. He went back through Macedonia to encourage them. Almost like, remember how I shared with you guys how, you know, the enemy is going to come after you and being a Christian is difficult and you will face tribulation. Yeah, and remember you said, we're good, Paul. What do you think now? Whoa. And now they're talking about it's, it's difficult. And, and the families have opposed me, and, and my work has opposed me, and the temptation, man, my friends keep knocking on the door saying, come on, who are you now? And it's, it's tempting. Discouragement. I, I, you know, I, I was sick. I was discouraged. I was depressed. Whatever the case may be, it's, it's difficult. There's a lot of things that Christians go through. We all struggle. 2 Corinthians 1, verses 3 and 4 says, Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our tribulations, that we may be able to comfort those who are in trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. I don't know how to comfort people. Have you ever been comforted by God? Well, yeah. That's how you do it. The comfort that God has given us. He doesn't say there in Corinthians, and Corinthians is a pretty crazy church. Okay, Corinthians is a church that struggled. At what point Paul tells the church in Corinthians, he goes, I couldn't talk to you about spiritual stuff because you're too fleshly. I got to talk to you about fleshly stuff because you're not spiritual enough. But here he says, listen, but God has comforted you guys. And, and how God's rebuked you, then rebuke others. He didn't say that. He says how God has comforted you. He's comforted you that you could, those that are in trouble, that you can comfort those as, as God's comforted you. Folks, we, we all struggle. We all struggle at times. We all suffer at times. We need to be, we need to be checking on one another. We need to be praying for one another. If somebody comes to your mind during the week and, and one of the brothers or sisters' mind or faith comes to mind, pray for them. Well, well, how do I pray? I don't know. I don't know what God is showing them, and you don't need to know the details either. Don't say, well, I'm going to call them and see what they're messing up on. No, just, you know what, Lord, they, I don't know what they're going through or if they're going through. I just want you, Lord, to comfort them and strengthen them. If, if they're sinking, Lord, may they reach up to you. May they look up. Lord, share with them your presence. Let them, Father, be aware of your grace and your love. Comfort them, Lord. And if you know the phone number, give them a call. And you don't have to call them and say, so, how you doing? <laughs> Just call them and say, oh, what's going on? And if they go, wow, you've never called me before. Ah, I apologize. You know what, Lord's really laid in my heart. I, I just... You know, we know each other. I have your number. You only give your number to people you care about. You've given me your number. So obviously we have a relationship. I just called to say, hey, just, just to see how you're doing and to pray for you. And, you know, you don't have to call and say, struggling, huh? Because God put your face in my mind. You don't have to tell them that. You just call and encourage them. So... Paul has gone through Macedonia to encourage the Christians, to encourage the, 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 the churches that, that God has planted in, in those regions. He, he left Ephesus and he goes through the region of Macedonia, encouraging them, and he ends up in Greece. Though it's not stated where he went in Greece, most believe he ended up uh, in, in Corinth. Uh, and he stayed there for three months. So, so here's, here's, where, here's where Paul, we believe Paul is now, right over here, number five, uh, is, is where we believe that he is for three months. And, and there, once he's there for three months and, and doing the work of the Lord and sharing with the, with the Christians there and, and God is building that church, um, 
is planning on sailing to Syria. Okay, he just he, he knows that from here, I, the Lord has laid on my heart, I'm, I'm going to go to Syria. Um, but he gets word that there's a plot against him. So he changes the route. So here's his deal, you guys. He, he's here, and he's planning on going over, over here to Syria, okay? Uh, and, and, uh, but he's planning on taking the, the ship to go over here in Syria. But he finds out there's a plot. So he said, well, I'm just going to go back up and around the way I'd gone before. I just, I'm going to pass through those churches again. And, and I'm sure he encouraged them some more. I love how Paul doesn't, doesn't complain. He doesn't, you know, really? I mean, I, I, I've already walked that route once. And now I just want to sit on a boat and rest and cruise and get some sleep and some rest and, and to this long cruise. But God says, no, I want you to walk again and go back the other way. He, he doesn't whine. He doesn't complain. He doesn't get mad just because his plans were changed. I've often shared with you guys, I get angry when people mess with my plans. Um, I get an attitude when people mess with my plans. I, I, I plan out my plans for the day, for the hour, for whatever. And, and if someone said, hey, can you do this? It's like, mm, it's not in my plans. It doesn't fit. Well, can you make it fit? Mm, I'd rather not. You know, and, 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 and so God has blessed me with a wife that loves to mess with my plans. Okay. It's just, you know, and, and, and it's, it's to help me understand. She doesn't do it. Like I'm going to help Jim out here. Uh, she just, she, she always has stuff on her mind and always doing things. And we can be sitting and having a cup of coffee. Oh, you know what? You know what we have to do? And she'll come up with something. And I'm always telling her, just have a cup of coffee with me. We don't have to do anything right now. Oh, okay. All right. Oh, you know what? You know what else? You know what else? We just, we just have a cup of coffee with me. We don't have to do anything right now. We'll do it when we're done with the cup of coffee. Okay. All right. Oh, you know, I was thinking. And, uh, and it's like, well, quit thinking. Okay. And, and she's, she's always, her mind's going a mile a minute. She dreams all the time. And she always tells me, why do I dream? Because your mind won't stop. And why are they weird dreams? I can't answer that. But Paul, you know, God says, I want you to go a different route. All right. He goes a different route. And, and it's such a blessing because now it's even more difficult, you guys, because the size of Paul's group that's traveling with him is getting bigger. We read the list of the guys that, that are from various areas that are now a part of Paul's traveling. But they... They leave and they head, the, the whole group, back to the map real quick. I'm sorry, I might have messed them up there. The whole group ends up over here because they, they, they don't take this route. The whole group goes over to here, but then all but Paul head over here to Troas. Okay? Paul didn't get on the, the boat with them. Uh, and, and let's read the situation here in, in, in our text, Acts 20, beginning in verse 7. Now, on the first day of the week after they had arrived in Troas, when the disciples came to get together to, to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and, and continued his message until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered together, in a, window, in a window sat a certain young man named Eutychus, who was sinking into a deep sleep. He was overcome by sleep, and as Paul continued speaking, he fell down from the third floor and was taken up dead. But Paul went down, fell on him, and embracing him, said, Do not trouble yourselves, for his life is in him. Now when he had come up, uh, had broken bread and eaten, and had talked a long while, even till daybreak, he departed, and they brought the young man in alive, and they were not a little comforted. So they, they leave from Philippi, and, and Paul waits for a few days and joins them a few days later as they end up over here in Troas. Uh, Philippi up there by number six, uh, and, uh, and so now they're all together again there. Uh, in Troas. Paul's last night in Troas. And he, he spends his last night teaching God's word to them. Now, this is the first 
clear reference in the scriptures of believers meeting for worship on the first day of the week, which would have been Sunday. Okay, so this is, I'm not saying this is the first time they met on a Sunday. This is the first time in scriptures that it mentions that they gathered together on a Sunday, the first day of the week, uh, for their time of worship. Most Christian churches now worship on Sundays. Jesus rose on a Sunday, uh, and so they look at it as a, a new beginning, a new work that God is doing, and so they, they worship, we worship on Sunday. There are some churches and there are some people who believe the day of worship should remain uh, on the Jewish Sabbath, uh, which would be Saturday. Jewish Sabbath would go from sundown on Friday to sundown on Saturday. Okay, so there are still people, there are still churches that believe very strongly that that is the Sabbath and that is when we should be gathering. And if you gather on Sundays, you are wrong uh, and you shouldn't be doing it that way. So there's a little bit of a conflict. Uh, there was even a conflict in the early church. Old habits are hard to break, you guys. Uh, and, and so there were people in the days of Paul that didn't like this idea of not meeting on the Sabbath or or not making the Sabbath the day of the week, and they switched it to the first day. It'd be like you and I making Monday our worship day. It's like Monday's the first day of the week. Sunday wraps up the week, a day with the Lord, worship with God, going to church, praising the Lord, opening his word. Monday begins the day of the week. Well, in the Jewish calendar, their Saturday was the worship. Sunday was their Monday and the beginning of the week. And they struggled with it. It's just like, you know, these, these Christians are messing with everything. Um, Paul writes in Romans 14, verses 5 and 6, he says, One person esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord. And he who does, he who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. There were Christians that were saying, listen, God's not asleep six days a week and awake on the Sabbath. Every day is a godly day. Every day is a day of worship. Every day is a day of reading God's word. Every day is a day of, of growing in the Lord and learning from the Lord, not just one day a week, every day. And so Paul says, you know what? I'm sure they wanted Paul, so tell us, Paul, which way to go here. He's going, here's the deal. You feel like, like the Sabbath or Sunday is like the day? Praise God. What are you doing on that day? I'm worshiping God. I'm seeking the Lord. I'm following the Lord. I'm, I'm, I'm coming before the Lord. I'm fellowshipping with Christians. So you're doing it for the Lord. I am. All right. Well, I believe every day is the same. Well, what are you doing every day? I, I read every day. I pray every day. I walk with the Lord every day. I talk to Christians every day. Well, all right. So he's basically saying, whatever, you know, I'm not going to, say, well, if you don't worship seven days a week, then you're not a real Christian. Or if you don't recognize the Sabbath on Saturday, then you're not really a Christian. He says, whatever the Lord, just worship God. That was his heart. That was his point. And that's God's point. Just seek the Lord. And so this is the first time that we have biblically in the scriptures mentioning that the church, this particular group was gathering on Sunday. So obviously the people of Troas uh, loved the word so much that they couldn't get enough of it. And, and Paul taught them till midnight. Okay, so I'm, I'm assuming he started at sunset because in these days when the sun was up, that's when you get stuff done. Uh, and when sun sets, that's when you, you go to bed or you have your Bible studies and what have you. But the people were hungry. They knew that Paul was going to be leaving. And so they, they're hungry for the word. It's, you know, and, and they, they're hungry for fellowship. This, is, this may be the last time they see Paul. And so they just love the fellowship. It's like when you have somebody from out of town, one of your friends come and visit you, you, you generally stay up later than you normally do. Why? Because you haven't seen them in a while, especially the last night. When they're leaving in the morning, it's like you don't, you don't even sleep. You stay up until the next morning. Uh, and, and it's, it's that, that's where they find themselves. It's like, don't stop Paul. Just, you know, keep teaching us, keep sharing with us, keep fellowshipping. Unfortunately, 
there was a horrible accident as Paul taught for so long. Eutychus fell asleep as he was sitting in the window uh, and, and fell out the window three stories down and he fell to his death. Eutychus had probably worked all day, so he was tired. Uh, it was around April or May, so the weather was warm. Um, he was in the third story, heat rises in buildings. Uh, it says that there were uh, a lot of lamps in the room, not lights like this, but lamps, meaning there was oil and fire and, and that consumes oxygen. So the room had to have been extremely stuffy. It was filled with people knowing that this is Paul's last night with them. And so very difficult situation. Eutychus was sitting in the window trying to get fresh air and trying to stay awake. But he lost the battle and fell asleep, deep sleep. So much so he fell out the window. Paul then runs down and, and doesn't say, well, see, that's what you get for falling asleep during a Bible study. All right? God's, he look up the rest of the, see? See, you want to fall asleep during my studies? You know, no, his heart is like, oh my gosh, he understood. I'm sure Paul was up there sweating and having a hard time besides just trying to breathe. He's talking. So he doesn't rebuke anybody. In compassion, he runs down and, 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 and embraces Eutychus and prays over Eutychus, and, and, and God brings life back to Eutychus. No one's sleepy now. <laughs> after, after Eutychus goes back upstairs, no one's sleeping now. It's like, oh, I'm awake. How about you? Yeah, we're all awake. Well, then let's have some communion. And so they break bread together. Then they just fellowship until morning. Now, please understand, when the sun rises, it's time to go to work. They didn't get any sleep, and nobody's complaining. They just enjoyed the fact that they were together. Folks, fellowship is sweet. It really is. It is it's comforting. It's encouraging to to spend time with one another. I, I, I love when the body of Christ just, just hang out and fellowship together and talk and, and encourage one another. If you're just casually fellowshipping, that's probably the most or the best opportunity of being an encourager because you're not set on doing anything. You're just talking and the subjects come up and, and you're responding to and, and, and then there's a person sitting there who don't, you don't know us yet, but they're going through something that you're talking about and they're being encouraged. Fellowship is, is sweet. And so we see Paul concluding his time with the church there and they fellowship all night long until morning. And then Paul has to leave and he heads for um, uh, uh, Asos. Uh, look, at, look at chapter 20 of Acts, verse 13. Then we went ahead to the ship and, and sailed to Assos, uh, there intending to take Paul on board, for so he had given orders, intending himself to go on foot. And when, we, and when he met us at Assos, we took him on board and came to uh, Metellini. Uh, we sailed from there, uh, and the next day uh, came opposite uh, uh, Chios, uh, the following day, we arrived at Samos and stayed at Tro Covina, West Covina, Azusa. Uh, they ended up in, in Miletus. <laughs> uh, verse 16, for Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he would not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hurrying to be in, at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. So Paul goes uh, and the guys uh, head to Miletus. Back to our map real quick here. Uh, do you guys see Miletus right here? So they're in Troas, and they come to Miletus. The interesting thing is the guys all went by boat. Paul went by land. Um, wanted to spend some personal time. Um, Everybody gets on the boat and, and heads to Assos, but oh, I'm sorry, I told you Miletus, they went to Assos. Let me re redirect that, you guys. <laughs> they leave Troas, a quick journey to, to uh, Assos, and then Paul just walked by land up there. Sorry. Um, he decides to go by land by himself. And then he rejoins them 
in Assos. Paul was probably wanting to spend some alone time, personal time with the Lord. Not that he didn't enjoy the fellowship, not that he didn't enjoy the companionship. He, he leaned heavily. Paul, as you go through the book of Acts, he leaned heavily on his friends and his, his fellow uh, servants and traveling together. But there's times of need to just spend some personal time with the Lord. We read in the Gospels that Jesus would sometimes send his disciples on ahead while he would go off into the hills and just spend some personal time with his father. He would just pray and, and seek the Lord. Uh, it, it's so important that we all, all of us spend personal time with the Lord so we can personally hear his voice, so we can personally be comforted and guided by the Lord himself. Isaiah 26, 3 says, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. By putting us, by putting our mind on the Lord and just spending some quiet personal time by ourselves, we get to hear God's voice. We get to hear his encouragement. We get to hear his guidance. And so Paul just, you know what, guys, go on ahead. I just want to walk by myself and, and just spend some personal quiet time with God. And folks, I, I can't emphasize enough to have that personal time with the Lord and, and just be quiet with him and, and just give your attention to him as he gives his attention personally to you. So they leave Assos and they pass. It says that they passed Ephesus. Okay, back to the map again. Now I'll take you to Miletus. Now they leave Assos and they are all traveling. Here's Ephesus and you would think, well, let's go there. No, he goes on down here to Miletus. He passes by there and goes past that because he wanted to get to Jerusalem by the day of Pentecost. Pentecost is 50 days after the Passover. And so Paul figures, listen, I know if I stop at Ephesus, I'm not going to get out of there. Uh, he had spent three years there in Ephesus. He had close relationships there in Ephesus. And he understood, if I stop at Ephesus, I'm not going to make the Passover in Jerusalem in time. So he goes past Ephesus and heads down to Miletus. Next week, uh, he'll bring some of the elders from Ephesus and talk with them. But that's, that's for next week. So let me wrap it up today. It's exciting to see. It's exciting to see how the Lord was leading Paul in his mission trip. God would change his traveling plans. God would lay it on his heart that, that he should spend some personal time. Uh, God would have him, listen, let's, let's not do Ephesus this time. And, and so God was leading his steps. Paul had plans, and, and Paul expressed some of his plans, but God changed him. And so Paul was just excited to follow the Lord. And when we draw close to the Lord, we will be aware of his leading. And, and we will therefore follow his leading because we understand it's his leading. And we'll accept the changes that he has. I often bring this up, you guys. If, if you're on your way somewhere and, and you're in a hurry, and I'm the type of guy that, to me, 15 minutes early is, is, is almost late. Okay, and so if I'm on my way someplace and, and traffic comes or a change of route comes, I'm upset. And I don't even stop and just think, well, I don't know why. I don't know if there's a song on the radio the Lord wants me to hear. I don't know if there's somebody that I need to stop and help. I don't know if he just wants to speak to my heart. I don't know. But I'm forced to take a different route or a slower route, and I just have to accept it. And, and if if I'm not in a close personal relationship with the Lord, I'm, I'm not hearing this from him. I'm angry at the dumb people in front of me who won't go fast or, or the, the dumb people who did a foolish move and now there's an accident or the construction crew that has now shut down the freeway and I have to go around. It has nothing to do with God. I'm just mad at all these people for messing up my plans. But if we really have that close relationship with Lord, it's like, well, obviously I didn't need to be there 15 minutes early. In fact, apparently I'm supposed to be there 15 minutes late. 
because I can't change this. And therefore, God, what are we doing? Speak to my heart and just, just accepting you guys. But, but if we're not close with the Lord, our emotions are what lead us, not our relationship with God. But the main thing that I really want us to take home today is we need to be encouragers. We need to be encouragers to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Walking with the Lord in this perverse world is hard. It's hard for all of us. Everyone is being tempted. Everyone is going through struggles. Maybe not all at the same time. Maybe not all in the same degree. But we all face this. We all struggle at times. We all suffer at times. And therefore, we need to encourage each other going out of our way to give each other a good word to make the heart glad, to bring peace. We need to go out of our way to strengthen those who are thinking. We need to go out of our way to reach out and steady those that are, are wobbling and stumbling. We can't just go, oh, did you see that? They just fell. No, we need to run over there and catch them. I, my mother-in-law lives with Jeanette and I, and she's 96 years old. So she doesn't run and skip as she used to. Uh, you know, I mean, trust me, guys, when she was 90, she was hard to keep up with. Uh, we can finally keep up with her. Uh, but but when, she, when she leaves the house, it's, it's walking beside her and, 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 and walking her down. We have two steps two steps to get down from our front porch down. It's, it's, it's making sure it's being there. And, and this is, this is what God says for all of us as brothers and sisters in the Lord, you know, not like, you know, what uh, they're all messed up or they're, you know, they watch, 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 watch. No, no, no. Come alongside, help one another. Please don't be nosy. Um, please don't try to get into each other's business, but just, be there. If somebody wants to share with you, let them share with you. But don't, don't be the prying individual. Just be the encourager. You know, they don't even have to know that you're there to help them. I'm sure it frustrates my mother-in-law at times that, you know, I got this. You know, leave me alone. I don't need your help. I'm sure it's, it's frustrating to, to watch your world begin to shrink in your abilities. And so... You know, I don't come alongside of here, let me help you, you're old. You know, that, that's not going to score any points. Oh, here, let me help you, you're feeble. I just come alongside and, and help. And, and there's times, she, and she'll tell me, no, I got it. Okay, so I'll take a step back, only this far, so that if necessary, but I don't go, fine, do it yourself. No, 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 I, I'm there to help. We're here to help one another. And so please, in, in the world, in the times that we leave in, live in, Christians, we need one another. We need to encourage one another. We need to help those who are sinking, stabilize those who are wobbling. Not by condemning them, not by giving them orders, not by telling them what to do, but by just, I'm here. Lean on me. I got you. Let me pull you out. Not just throw them a rope. Reach in and grab them. Amen. Father, thank you for your love and your grace. Thank you, Father, for being so attentive to our lives. To be so, for being so sensitive, Father, to our struggles, our hurts, our pains. Lord, these emotions and feelings and grace and love that are a part of you are now a part of all of us. Our God dwells within us. So, Lord, may we be sensitive to your emotions and your affections and your grace and your love amongst one another. May we be willing, Father, to be the men and the women to come alongside and, and be encouragers. I know, Lord, there's times of rebuke. I know, Lord, that there's times of, of strong rebuke. I understand that, Father. But, Lord, not all the time. So often, Lord, we just simply need to be beside one another and just sharing a word. So, Father, as a body of believers, may we have that sensitivity of God. 
May we have that comfort of Jesus. May we have that strength of your spirit, Father, as we walk in the midst of this world, this difficult world, in the grace and the power and the love and the ways of, of the Lord. Father, we come before you now to worship you. Pray that you will just bless this time of worship, stirring our hearts. We do lift up our offering before you, Father, as it is a part of our worship that you bless it. Father, we do also pray, Lord, that you would prepare our hearts as we partake in communion together, remembering that the life we have is because of the suffering of Jesus. So bless as we worship you now. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship. 